century. The effect of the ship's motion on telescopic observation and photography had concerned most people, and various ideas were used to counteract this. Commander Henry Hatfield was keen to put his ideas to the test. You can see the, um, the ship is moving, and you keep the shadow of the foresight on the middle of that target there, and then the picture's in the middle of the camera. And you can see it's not too difficult to hold it um, quite steady there. If I let it go, you'll see it swings about quite a lot. The BAA vice president's ideas involved a certain amount of improvisation, as did this arrangement of Meccano, a camera tripod, and a bottle of water. This pendulum system, have you just made this just for this trip? Yes, the, ba the basic pendulum system to, to compensate for the movement of the ship. It's, it's a fairly standard tripod which can be used for other astronomical telescopes and cameras, but basically this, this system is just for the trip. And what's this gadget? Well, this is the, the, the shut, shutter release for, for the camera, a fairly standard shutter release, so I had to make a special right angle fitting to get into it to allow for the telescope. Sure. And this will hold it still for the eclipse? Well, I would, I would hope to. It should, it's certainly on the trials we've done so far, it would damp out about 50% of the movement. The rest of it should be able to compensate by hand. Mm. A windmill arrangement of slotted angle with weight on the ends of the arms was another variation. We have here two cameras. Um, the lower one is a 1500 millimeter camera, which will produce a sun uh, image of about a centimeter on the film. And on top of this, I have a 400 millimeter lens uh, for wider angle uh, shots, particularly of the outer corona. The lower lens, I'll get the prominences um, and some of the um, outer corona going up to about half a solar radius. Um, after that, I expect the movement of the ship would be too much. And so for photographs for a wider corona, I'm using the 400 millimeter lens and that should produce pictures out to quite some distance, uh, providing that the movement of the ship there was a lot of interest in everybody's equipment now being assembled and tested. This type of telescope is a, a Maxutov design which employs only spherical surfaces. The primary mirror at the bottom end here is exactly spherical with a hole in the centre and at the far end, as you can see, I think, if you look down the tube, there is a, a meniscus lens where the sides are parallel, it's just a thin sheet of glass, not shaped as a lens at all except that it's tagged in. And there's a little black spot in the middle of it which is silvered on the inside, so that light comes down the tube, reflects from the prime mirror, reflects from the little dot in the middle and back through the eyepiece. It's a folded telescope and effectively, although it's, what, only about a foot long, it's the equivalent of a telescope some 56 inches focal length. So, when we're using a camera here, we're getting quite a magnified view. I've been trying to track the sun just now and, uh, as you can see, there's this roll of about 15 degrees, it's almost impossible. But the view on a stable day would be quite stationary on the film here and we could get exposures ranging from a thousand up to a tiny exposure. What I'm doing to cut the light level down is to use this filter. Now this is made by evaporating thin metal onto a glass film and most of the light has been reflected back. The transmission is less than the thing, 2% and uh, it screws on the objective lens so there's no danger at all in using this directly looking at the sun. Most people, of course, have telescopes which are directly in line, so that you're looking up through the eyepiece at the sun. If the filter breaks, you've got the full benefit of all the light on your retina and you never see again. This has a, lens, a filter in such a position that the light is taken out before it's concentrated. So there's no danger that's splintering and you can look directly into it through that eyepiece. A low-lying deck chair and a gun sight mounting for the handheld telescope seemed an inexpensive arrangement. Well, basically, the idea is that until uh, totality, I, I line up the whole thing on the spotter telescope, and all the cameras are centered on the one spot so that I can get the picture, and tomorrow I'm going to mark the thing so that I, we can see exactly when the sun is in the right position, and then we can take the photographs on any of the telescopes. Okay? 
And the moment we get totality, I remove that and then I can look straight up the telescope. Dr. Apple's expensive and elaborate equipment had needed a special trailer to bring it up from his home in Plymouth. Looking round the ship's decks, it's doubtful if there had ever been such a trip where so much of the passengers' luggage was marked wanted on voyage. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm trying to get the various regions of the, for the eclipse. With this one, I'm trying to capture the prominences. Mm. With this one, the inner corona, and that one, the outer corona. Well, how can you tell the difference between, how do you differentiate between when you're taking? Ah, well, there's a different types of cameras. This is an F2.8, when a, wide, a reasonably wide field of view, and this will record the very weaker um, mm. tones of colour. But I keep the apertures fixed, but alter the exposures. I see. Do you keep a record of that? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, I've got a tape recorder here, and I speak into the, t the microphone, saying exactly what I've done on each, each time I alter the exposure. Crayford Astronomical Society had ten of its members on the ship, one of them being Gordon Collins. This piece of apparatus is known as an all-sky camera. It is consisted of a spherical dome silvered all over to get 180 degree vision. We have a 35 millimeter camera mounted on top and we are interested in getting shots of the sky darkening all the way around plus the corona in the, somewhere in the field of view. Here we have another all sky camera, the same principle but with a cine camera mounted on top. Here we shall be taking five second bursts every 25 seconds about starting from 12 minutes before totality. And uh, just before Bailey Beach, we shall be taking longer bursts to catch the shadow bands going across. But John Cope had his doubts about all the intended photography. Photographing a total eclipse of the sun, you know, is, well, I don't know, it's rather like photographing a Beethoven symphony, really. It isn't just a, a spectacle, you know, it's not a spectacle. It, it, it's a magnificent spectacle. It's something beyond description. Nevertheless, a lot of people have gone to a lot of trouble and expense to try and record some sort of description. Keith Brackenbury had a sophisticated electronic control system for his equipment, and more electronic apparatus have been brought along by John Bumgarner from San Francisco, doing experiments in conjunction with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Pasadena. Just before and just after totality, when most people are looking up at the crescent sun, the very narrow crescent is just immediately there. There are frequently found shadows flying along the ground that, that have a band-like structure. And a lot of people miss this because they're, they're looking up at the sun at the time. Now, not much is known about these things called shadow bands, but this equipment is designed to, to take and read with a detector in there the changes in the sunlight that occur as the shadows move around. Now there's an oscillator inside whose frequency is determined by the amount of light that falls on this detector. And as the, as the detector receives the light and the light changes, we have a change in the oscillator tone. If you put the earphone in your ear, you can hear what I mean. As the shadows, my fingers for instance, might be the shadow band, go across, you can hear the chirping of the oscillator inside as it varies its frequency. And this we record on magnetic tape with a, with a magnetic tape recorder and we hope to determine more about shadow bands in this manner. And, uh, and that's just about it. It's, uh, it's very hard to photograph, and so we use a photometer like this to study it instead. In the midst of all the setting up and testing of equipment, Monte Umbe came in sight of land for the first time since leaving Liverpool. Capital of Gran Canary, Las Palmas. The Canary Islands' colourful vegetation, modern hotels and wonderful climate have earned the reputation of the islands with eternal spring. Holiday makers and tourists from Europe and further afield visit the islands in ever-increasing numbers. And the airport at Las Palmas is of international standard, accommodating all types and sizes of aircraft. Alongside the modern passenger air terminal is the older original airport building. Behind here, cast in a strictly operational role, especially for the eclipse, was a first-time visitor to the Canary Islands, 001, the Anglo-French Concord. This is one way of getting above the Earth's atmosphere, practically and for all intents and purposes. The Concorde will be flying along the track of totality for this eclipse, 
joining it on the Mauritanian side, moving into the totality area and crossing it gradually over a whole distance of about a thousand miles. Now the plan here is to keep pace with the moon's shadow as it crosses the desert. As you know, the shadow will be moving at something like 1,500 miles an hour, and this is one way of keeping pace with that movement. The shadow is a tiny circular dot on the desert, and if Concorde stays in the center of that dot for as long as it can, we can have an eclipse instead of six or seven minutes lasting for up to an hour and more. So this is the Concorde plan. Experiments have been installed on the aircraft, poking through holes that have been cut in the shell, looking straight out at the sun through a minimum of Earth's atmosphere. We are undoubtedly assured of some very effective results from this sort of experiment. One of the experiments that's being carried on Concorde this time will be to investigate the appearance of the corona in infrared light. Now this requires specific techniques. Above all, it needs to be clear of the Earth's atmosphere. So this equipment's being flown at a very high altitude and the equipment will poke straight through the side of Concorde, which has been quite an expensive operation to get the panels made, of course, and then observations will be made at that right temperature.